to normally meet except for today uh, from 2 o'clock to 3.15 although I'll be I'll be uh, flexible with Dr. Albrecht if he needs to switch one day I'll switch uh, but and and I guess since we have people who may not anyway, as long as you're both we're good um, okay so that's that's it uh, 2 o'clock to 3.15 for me Monday Wednesday so a little bit of background on this course for probably, I don't know how long now, probably at least the last 10 years, what's been going on is we meet once a week for 404, and we have a lecture day, and then we have a, and, and during which we talk about data communications topics, and uh, that's, it's about as fulfilling as you can expect. And then we have like three hours on, about three hours on Thursdays and Fridays, historically, when we did hands-on stuff. And everybody, that's like playing with Legos. Everybody's super happy about that. Um, but, but we've had some challenges in that we keep on expanding the program. As we've, we only have 30 stations in there. And the next, you know, so we keep on putting like 34 people in one of the lab sections. And now they want to add in, potent, you know, in the future, hopefully another um, cohort of 60 or 70 students. And so we're logistically running up against some problems with that. So this semester is an experiment. And we're going to try to not use that lab uh, almost the whole semester, except for this week. So, no, but but there's still going to be good stuff. Don't worry. Uh, so, so it says that your your lab time is from 9 a.m. to 12 p.m. on Thursday or Friday. That will only be this week. What what we're going to do instead is meet on both Monday and Wednesday. And my goal is to embed in the class hands-on activities. So it'll be part discussion, part hands-on activities, and uh, we'll see how it goes. I have high hopes. Any questions about that? Yeah. Does that mean we will not be meeting on Fridays? Then? That is correct. Other than this week, we're not supposed to meet on Thursdays or Fridays. So, okay. yeah. so like the lab time you signed up for. Uh, That's correct. So it's there for historical reasons, but I'm trying to change that right now and see if we can make it so the class, so this program can expand by embedding lab activities in class time as opposed to over there. So. And, and a lot of people want to have jobs on Thursdays and Fridays, and that was totally messing people up. So that's another reason. Yeah. So just uh, so we don't have classes on Fridays for other than this Friday. That that is correct. Unless there's an announcement uh, that we're we're planning on uh, only meeting this week in the lab. Okay. Wait. So follow up question on that. Yeah. We will meet here Monday, Wednesday, 2 to 3.15. Okay, and there's no Friday class and no lab. Except for this week, right. And this week we don't meet Wednesday. So, so because we're doing the lab, so we, we would only ever meet two days a week anyway. Because we're doing the lab this week, you, we will um, not have class on Wednesday, but you, as, as Davis had mentioned, you will want to be here for uh, your 413 material. So they'll, they'll have that at uh, 12.30 on Wednesday. Okay, so that's the schedule. Here we have a, a Slack link for the class. Um, 404 is a different animal than 401. 401 is a class where I think it's hard to make it complicated in a way. It's like you're drawing pictures. You get like you know two or three circles in a line, and you read a story, and you draw a picture with that. So. Um, so, so we don't typically need to have a lot of conversations about that in our, in our, in our Slack channels and workspaces. Uh, this class is different. There, as I talk about IT broadly, IT is like an infinite hole of information. And every single day, there's probably more information 
create and, and knowledge created about IT than we could probably ever cover. So you're getting an introduction to this material, but you can spend the rest of your life learning about it. Because it is a relatively rich conceptual area, you'll, you'll want to treat this class differently in that you'll want to use Slack to talk a lot with one another. So post questions, answer questions. Answering questions will help you reinforce material. So unlike 401, uh, I think that you're going to want to use uh, for the Slack channel uh, a lot to, for communication. So I encourage it. Um, your TAs include Davis Busteed, who was recently here, and Danny Guzman. All right, this class. Um, Historically, this class, let me just grab this marker here. You don't have to be so quiet. Uh, historically, uh, if, if we talk about information systems programs across the world, every information systems program tends to have uh, a networking class. And so it's either called the networking class or it's called the data communications class. And so this class fulfills that spot. However, I will reveal to you that we are a little different here than at other schools. Uh, if I go to most programs around the country, 30% you know, of any given IS graduating class is probably going to go into a networking IT role. Here, the graduating class in any given year, even though we're much bigger, might include between zero and one people who go into IT or networking. So I'm aware of that, and so I kind of adapt this content to meet your needs. If I thought you were going to be networking professionals, then I would probably push us towards certification uh, in some way. But instead, I think this, we need some conceptual coverage of a lot of IT-related topics, included, including networking. Uh, I just met a, a student upstairs who said, wow, I'm doing security now, and I am so glad for this class. It's really, it's the, really the foundation for everything I'm doing in my life and my career going forward. And I was really pleased to hear that. I don't know that, but he said, you know, Tell your class, sometimes you're not a believer at the beginning, but this is kind of just all over everything you do later on. So this is, you know, if you think about bricks, this is the mortar between all the bricks. Uh, you really do need to understand this material. In terms of how I structured this class, the, there's kind of three parts to it. So one part, I would consider it to be kind of like computers and operating systems. We don't really get a chance to cover that in any other part of this program formally. So I'll give you a little bit of exposure in that. We have a networking portion of the class, which is relatively large, and that's the, the normal part. And actually, we used to have two different classes on networking. So this used to be the intro to data communications, and then we had advanced. But just preferences and placement for employment, we're just kind of phasing that out. So now we just have it being a part of this <coughs> class, although it's the bulk of it. And then on the back side of this class, we're going to have uh, AWS cloud um, cloud stuff. So uh, as we do the last few weeks of class, you should get all the content you need to pass the AWS cloud practitioner exam. If you've already passed that exam, talk to me and we'll find out some other content. <coughs> so as part of the networking portion of the class, some of the topics you get are the OSI model. It's a, it's a company seven layers. Uh, IP addressing, firewalls, routing, that sort of thing. Uh, moreover, on the IT side of things, we're going to be doing operating system, a little bit with operating systems, computer components this week. Uh, you already know about the cloud, and we'll hopefully hit containers in the last week. So around that is just a bunch of uh, wording related to these topics. Any, uh, any questions so far? Um, most of the material for this class is going to come out of this book. Um, as data communications books go, I've looked at several, and I don't, um, so I'm hemming, I'm trying to find something funny to say about it, but I'm just going to fail. Uh, among data communications books, this is a good one. Maybe one of the better ones. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> it goes downhill from here. So if you're not grateful, if you're not grateful, I'm going to I should just give you one of the other books to read, and then, and then you'll feel differently. Um, I saw a Slack message about how you could get an, an electronic version for relatively cheap. Otherwise, there's basic information about it. Uh, I've also asked you to acquire a Raspberry Pi for this class that we will start using as early as next week. Uh, 
Uh, do you have any questions about the pie? Yes. Does it have to be a four? No, I, I don't think so. Uh, and it doesn't have to be like the one gig one if you want to spend more and you can. So here's, I've got about 20 boxes of these up in my office. Um, so this is a Raspberry Pi. It's just a little computer that can do lots of different things. So it's comparable to a laptop or a desktop. Um, but it has pins so, we, so that we can connect it to external components and control them, both as sensors and as output. Uh, we can install web servers on here. You can have this be a media server for your home if you plug in a multi-terabyte drive. So you can run your own Netflix out of your house. Uh, there's a lot of different things that we can do with these. Uh, and so my goal in using this is to help you feel more connected to some of the things we're talking about. Because as we work with some things, we can run it all on virtual machines. But it's kind of, I think it just kind of sticks better when, when we put software on here and then we interact with this, you can picture it better in your mind. And then when we go to the cloud or virtual machines, like it just, uh, you understand it better, I think. So any questions about Raspberry Pi stuff? Yeah. Um, what are like some of the projects that you're doing with this? What are we gonna do? Well, um, if I can just scroll to that and talk about it in context. So uh, as you see, um, week nine and week 10, I'm calling it the Raspberry Pi Integrative Project. So one of the things to answer your question is, if you go online, there are literally thousands of different projects that you can do. You can make magic mirrors, you can make temperature and humidity sensors to put next to baby cribs. Uh, some students do that as part of their capstone projects historically. Uh, I've also bought a lot of different components that you guys can use. So you guys already own the Pi. I have bought thousands of dollars worth of components that you guys will be able to leverage as part of this class. So um, so one of the things I want you to do, did somebody drop their wedding ring? Yeah, that's me. <laughs> so, don't lose that. Somebody's going to be really upset. Uh, so, so one of the, so starting today even, starting today even, uh, I want you what I what I have in mind is for you guys to pick out like maybe a seven hour I don't know five six seven hour project for you guys to do over the course of that particular week, and then on the third day of it you'll we'll present the coolest ones in class. So um, so as a group. I want you to be a little bit self-directed. Rather than me saying, do this particular thing, look at all the thousands of things that you could do, and, and as a group, be like, hey, this is really awesome, let's do this, and then try and show off. Maybe we'll have a vote and like win a candy bar, or donut, or I don't know, bragging rights, <laughs> case of soda. Um, but anyway, have that in the back of your mind. You'll, you'll have more ideas in just a minute uh, as I talk more about it, yeah. Where would you recommend to get them? Uh, I found that the links up here were, were some good places to do it. I mean, you can just Google the individual components by name there. Uh, and, and but So the Raspberry Pi itself, there's like four or five stores, official stores in the US. If you get it on Amazon, it tends to come in a package rather than just by itself in this little box. They, they tend to put a bunch of other stuff in it, which increases the price. If you want to pay just the minimum $35 base price, uh, you can go to the Raspberry Pi website, and it'll, it'll push you to the four or so American websites that'll sell them, and you can get that by itself. So there's different ways to do it. If you're trying to be real careful, you would just start with one of the four main uh, providers, and then just piecemeal pick up the components. Okay. But, but here's a few different options with some links that are possible, yeah. So with those options, like option one there, there's like three different links. Option one is all those together. Yeah. Yeah, you need to be able to plug it in. You need a, a card. And uh, the the micro HDMI and HDMI cord, you, you might that's the one thing you might be able to get away without. Uh, I'm gonna make a video, but it won't be bad to have it. Um, I'm gonna so another question people were asking last time is well, don't I need a, a keyboard and a mouse and things like that? Uh, one of the, so today and next Monday are the kind of two squishy days in my head. Like I feel like I've got a battle plan. I'm locked and loaded for every other day. Um, at least, uh, but today and next week, or next Monday when we 
have our first day with the pies. Those are the day. Those are the, where things could potentially go wrong in here. Um, so I'm, I'm still working out the details because we've never done this before. But um, so as it relates to the pies, one of the things you can do is you can just power them on, plug them in, and then you can remote into them. So you can just remote desktop into your Pi, in which case you would only need a power supply for it. So, but to get them set up the very first time, we are gonna need a keyboard and a monitor. So uh, after thinking about it this morning, what I had planned on doing was having us all do that in class, but after thinking about it after this morning, I think what I'll do is I'll make a video of how to do it, and then you can use the lab resources to do it on your own, and we'll, can we'll cancel class on Monday. So I'm pretty sure that's going to be the easiest way logistically to get this all done. So, but after you get everything set up the first time, you'll be able to just uh, remote into it after you plug it in. So you'll be able to bring it to class, power it up, and then you'll be working um, remote desktop in, into it or SSH in, into it, terminal into it. Questions? All right. Um, related to the three categories of information I talked about, here's what we're, we're, how we're going through things in the class. Today is the syllabus day. Uh, this, Friday, this Thursday, Friday, you will be building a computer as part of a lab. The, the purpose of it is to give you some experience in disassembling a computer and then reassembling the computer. You'll also have an associated uh, homework assignment in addition to the lab. The following week, next week, it, we're getting started with our pies and we'll spend a whole day working with Linux. Uh, and now, now you'll get a little bit of Linux in this program because of, for example, the Python class, but that's in the context of doing some development. This is gonna be from the perspective of if you needed to support this, like what is, it some, what is a Linux administrator, somebody who is hosting your web applications and other types of applications, like what do they know when it's not just developing on your local computer? What do they know and what are they concerned about in terms of running things in production? So the instruction will be uh, from that perspective. Uh, after that, we hit the core of the class, which is the networking. Notice that it's has, it mentions the layers, like layer one, two, three, four, and seven. So when we talk about networking, there are seven different layers where there are technologies that operate in order for us to be able to send ones and zeros from one device to another device. Uh, so we're going to be stepping through each of those and learning about those in great depth, and that's you know the core of the class historically. Uh, after that, we'll spend a week and a half doing a project, so it's a choose-your-own project with the Pi, and then the last <coughs> approximately three weeks of material will be covering AWS Cloud Practitioner exam content. Uh, from AWS's perspective, they have some professional material that they create. So the material for the Cloud Practitioner exam is called the Cloud Foundations material. So we'll be hitting that uh, over the last few weeks. A lot of that is conceptual. Uh, I'm gonna try to add in a project to that. So we'll have labs associated with it, but I think I'll probably put on uh, an applied project as well. So any questions about the schedule of things we're doing? Something I forgot to ask in the last class that I'll ask you <coughs> is your preference for testing. So what is your preference for testing? On the 26th, would you rather have a midterm in class that lasts an hour and 15 minutes and it begins and it ends here, or would you rather have an entire five-day block open in the testing center and you can go in there and take it anytime you want? Oh yeah, for sure. The same test. Pardon? The same test as earlier. No. <laughs> I, th I, think you, I think you backed me into a corner here. So, what I would like to do, what I've historically done, is I've had a nice, rigorous test that you can spend hours on in the testing center. Um, <laughs> in class, I have to shorten it. Uh, I don't like that, uh, but so I don't know if, if, if we can actually in public get a valid count here in terms of what your preferences are, but is your preference generally to do it in class in the hour and 15 minutes? Some people are saying no, some people are saying yes. Ooh, okay, well. 
All right. Okay. Um, I think there are some disadvantages in terms of doing it in class that we don't cover as much material. It's awkward to be around other people, people looking over your shoulder. You know, it's, the same questions are on the screen, just a couple feet in front of your face. It's hard not to look. It's it's kind of distracting. Um, I don't think it's the best. And then, plus, you need a little room to spread out and, and potentially do some handwritten questions. Yeah, Warren. What happens if you do it on Learning Suite? How does it go in class? Do it on Learning Suite. Like being basically there on Learning Suite, like you've done in class. Oh, and just but but what but not meeting here to say, hey, yeah, take it any time on Wednesday. Open the time on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth asking because sometimes the answer is yes. But um, <laughs> what about that? It's a little tricky, but it, would that be your preference? Would it be to do learning suite? You have like a whole day or a whole week to do it? Some people are saying no. Oh, it's so hard to not have consensus. Somebody's going to be mad. Yeah. It's not going to let you multi vote, is it? No. It only lets you vote one person you guys, can even, you guys can even do that right now if you want. So, well, I don't know that everybody's already in Slack, so maybe I should send out an email. I'll, I'll make a poll. I will make a poll. And. Uh, We'll, dis we'll disappoint somebody. Well, I need to get, I want to take into account section one. So, regardless, some people will be happy and some people will be disappointed. And uh, such is life. Wait till you guys are parents. It'll happen all the time. Somebody's always mad. Um, yes. So I, I, feel like, I feel like Elf right now. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> Is that candy? Yeah. Sugar? Yes. Um, so yeah, so think about it. Okay. Um, okay, so here's the, oh, well, all right, before we get to the ugly part. Um, so the format of things, this is how I think about the content we go over in 401 as well as this class. On any given day, we generally have a topic, let's just say it's layer one of the OSI model, which is the physical layer. For every concept that we cover in my classes, I like to have about four touch points to work you through things and scaffold your learning. So you have a reading, you have a quiz, we quickly review the reading in class, then we apply that material with some type of hands-on activity, then you do a homework assignment, then you get feedback from the TAs on the homework assignment, at the end of which you've had a lot of practice with something, and potentially a project. Uh, after, by the time you've done all those things, you're pretty solid in terms of the workplace. Uh, so it's going to be the same type of approach for this class. Yeah? So just the structure of the schedule. Mm -hmm. Is there any loops in here where it just gets drastically harder? Because like it's, it's just going to be like easy, 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 and then kill us again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, other than index. I appreciate you asking that question. So. Yeah, just like we put a lot, you know, you're a big guy, you put a bunch of weights on the bar, you want to know what's coming. Right, so, so, I personally, at least, you, at, least you can, at least you can get ready to max, right? Oh yeah, so, I personally think that... I do more than lift weights. That's not only I appreciate the fact that you're ripped. I wish I could say that. That's all. So I'm not, I'm not, I hope you don't think I'm big enough. Hey, I just, I just want to be you, man. So, okay. But in terms of, in terms of uh, what might be, what I think could potentially be difficult, I'm going to give you basically a chapter of information to do for almost every single, um, uh, networking day. I think that'll feel like a lot. Um, I don't think it'll feel like as much for all the other days, but I do think that those, and especially the kind of material it is, uh, I think it'll be heavier con conceptually, and there's going to be more to read and do during that time. So I think it'll be softer before then, and it'll, I think it'll be softer afterwards. The, the Cloud Foundation stuff is a little bit of a different animal, but it's... Mm, um, it still can be a little hard. Okay, so that covers the topics that we'll be covering in here.
All right, so let us talk about grading now. So, as you know, the, the target GPA for, the, for this program is 3.6. So basically, my bosses tell, and, and everyone else who's in the core, are told this will be the GPA for the class. What that, what that shakes out to be is we're allowed to give out about 20 A's, 20 A minuses, and the rest B's in each of the courses. Now, the way that that comes about may feel like it's different, but at the end of the day, it's all the same. We're not, unfortunately, we're not allowed to say, this is the bar, hit this bar, and everybody gets an A. Uh, I understand that Ernie is not accountable to anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> Ernie doesn't get paid, <laughs> and so he can't really be fired practically either. <laughs> but all of us faculty, <laughs> we, we, have to, we have to stick by it. And so regardless of how it felt like it, it, came, it comes out at the end of the day, really what happens in every single class is you're really rank ordered from how, how you do. And the top, you know, whether you got 95% or whether you got 55%, uh, if we think you did a good job, we will give out the maximum maximum number of A's that we can. Uh, and every year, you guys are pretty much consistent. So I know some people say, well, what if I get stuck in a smart group of, of students? You guys are super geniuses, so I will grant that to you. But you're also pretty consistent every semester. We get the cream of the crop from here at BYU. So in, in my opinion, if okay, so there's two different spots here. This is my professor's slot. This is my professional slot. So standing in the professional slot, uh, I, I think that you know all but maybe one or two people potentially in every section deserve an A in every in terms of your performance from my perspective from industry. In terms of what I'm allowed to do, I can't do that as a professor. So so you get rank ordered and, and that's how it goes. Um, I think it stinks. Dr. Anderson stinks, thinks it stinks. We all think it stinks, and and I know that it has negative um, impacts on people. Unfortunately, I can't, I'm not able to change it. I did reach out to the dean, and I, you know, especially as getting feedback from you guys, I reached out to the dean, and uh, she responded to me on Saturday night. I gave her a nice lengthy explanation of what all the challenges are with target GPAs, and uh, she forwarded that on, and, and publicly for me to see, to all the assistant deans, and she said, in essence, we understand what you're saying, I don't think that we're going to be able to do much about it, but we will talk about this and we will consider it. So I, I want you to know that at least in part, I, like I'm on your side, but there's not much I can do. I'm going to the highest authority I have. I said, I think we could do better here. Here are my suggestions, but I don't know that there's anything I can do. So yeah. Why is that a thing? Why is that a thing? Yeah. Uh, I, I really don't know for sure. Um, I, I, in years past, I've heard things about grade inflation being an issue among universities. I don't know if that relates to the employers, uh, wanting to be able to compare different schools. It, it's been an issue for, for a long time. You know, at places like Harvard as well, you know, they, they make the same argument. Well, if all these are straight A students, why do we have to, you know, in essence, curve some of them down? Um, I, I don't know. I, I haven't had at that level anybody say why they're doing it. Um, I think. So I, I hate to be dark about things, but I also like to be um, honest. I think, I think that part, there's a lot of things that are, are fantastic, about, fantastic about BYU. I think that part is currently broken and it can be improved. Um, the goal is to take every single individual and create the, and, and untap the, the, the top of their human potential. And I don't think that this approach is the way to do that. Um, so, but I can't do anything currently, but I will fight every day, this is the other, Professors will, whenever they have a chance. Okay, so uh, in terms of the breakdown of grading stuff, quizzes and labs and assignments, respect collectively that makes up about 20% of your grade. And um, I expect that you guys should be able to get nearly 100% on that. It's built into the class and assumed to work that way. Uh, the the first midterm is worth 35%. The second, mid, the second exam is worth 35%. Uh, so the first, thir the first midterm is gonna be largely on networking concepts. I think the, the second exam I will make 
exclusively or almost exclusively on AWS Cloud Practitioner content. Group projects, I plan on having three. 5% of your grade will come from Intex, and 5% will come from two group projects that we will do in here. Uh, I expect from those, you should be able to get nearly 100% on those. Um, the two group projects should be on something related to AWS building an infrastructure suitable for Intex and also something, your, your Raspberry Pi project, the one that you guys make up, choose your own adventure. And then uh, the question that you're dying to ask or about to be dying to ask is why 1.1% for extra credit? But did you have a different question? Yeah, um, what classes does like Intex affect in like last semester is just your class that like Intex got the grade for? Do you know that? Um, I think it should be weighted in in uh, the others, um, but I don't know what the percentages will be. Um, it's, last year was the first time we had a certain collection of classes, second semester in the core, that included security, analytics, and then web development. So, it, we, so we had a unique in-tex last year. I kind of felt like this class really didn't have a, a starring role uh, in in-tex last year. Uh, this year though, because I've changed the nature of the class, so that we have the Raspberry Pi material. So you guys will be able to interact with the physical world incoming and outgoing with these devices or do some type of internet of things type of approach. Uh, also as part of this class, you guys should be competent in setting up infrastructure in AWS. So the whole world of cloud computing is open to you. So if we combine that with the <coughs> security class, with the web development class, with the um, analytics class, uh, we haven't made up the project yet, but I think we could do something super cool. Like far, like way cooler than anybody's ever done in this program before. So, um, I, I would, so historically though, last year, I think it would have made sense to put most of the weight of the grade into the analytics class and to Albrecht's Python class. I think that's more where most of the weight would have gone. We'll see how things shake out this, this year. Um, okay, so regarding the extra credit, uh, I'm sensitive to people's desires to be on, as on top of their grades as possible because of the rank ordering. And so what you will, so, so what typically happens is we export the grades and then we make some adjustments and we put in the SONA and then, so for you guys it's kind of a surprise when you get your grades. I want to avoid that this semester and say that learning suite is the definitive answer to where you're at down to the point. Um, and I'm gonna do that, one of the ways I'm gonna do that is I'm gonna pretend like you already did the maximum amount of SONA credits. So, uh, if you do four credits of SONA, you get 1.1% of extra credit added to your exams. No one will ever be able to leapfrog you in the class. You will know where you are the whole time. Uh, however, if you don't do the SONA stuff, I'm not requiring you to do it, but just so you have a clearer picture of where you're at. Um, if you don't do the SONA stuff, then you will lose a 1.1% boost to your grade and to your exam at the end of the semester, or some portion of that. So I could either put SONA in ahead of time or after time, but then it's a surprise and people shift, shift as they uh, get the SONA stuff put in at the end. This, is, this makes it crystal clear all the way along, yeah. So does the SONA stuff affect where you are and like the ranking with the bell curve? Does that make sense? So, if you, so you pretty much have to do it Otherwise, everyone else is going to do it. And it doesn't matter if you're ace or anything. I'm going to make you sense. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's not like the credit. Right. Yeah, that's kind of a that, that's kind of a dilemma that I have. But the, the problem is I can't I can't say like here's the grades and then add in Sona and say oh now we don't have to follow the GPA target for the school. This is the only way I can kind of stick to that. Um, so. It's not perfect, but I've already, within Learning Suite, assumed that you did four credits. And uh, so if you did do four credits, you'll see where you are through the whole semester. And you won't change. If you don't do it, you might drop down a little bit. Yeah? Okay, um, either of you. I, I don't know if, like, you want to bring up, but is it, like, would you consider just not having extra credit? Because it would kind of bridge it, like, so we'd all have to do it, or we are getting to be lowered. I, I, I don't know if anyone feels the same way, but well, the, the, the Dr. Anderson said that his extra credit was after the bell curve. 
I don't know if that's actually true, but maybe you can <laughs> <laughs> Why is it the whole class? <laughs> <laughs> It, it, it's, it's not really extra credit. No, I, I, so I acknowledge what you're saying. And so, I'm, so, so I'm, I'm open to discussing it right now. I'm okay with taking it off and then not considering Sona. You get what you get. You'll know all the way through the class exactly where you're at. I'm okay with that. I don't want to, dis I don't want to disincentivize you guys from supporting the research that goes on in the college. But I don't want to give you extra work either. So I do want to honor the research that's going on and encourage you to do it. That's why it's on there. That's the only reason why it's on there. Um, but if you think it's better not to have it on there, I'm, it makes in some ways it makes my life cleaner. Yeah. Um, I'm on the point of not having it because like last semester, three of our classes had it, and so to get twelve studies, like I know I think there's gonna be like a few people that actually got twelve. Like I think the rest of us got anywhere from like five to ten. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's troubling. Yeah. Um, I would actually argue against that. Oh no! Because I know for a fact that not everyone like, and maybe it was just because it wasn't available. But I know that there were lots of people who didn't do it, so it still is extra credit. Like, definitely still extra credit. Negative extra credit for people who don't do it. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. I feel like when with weighted grades where there's only a certain amount of people that can get A's and a certain amount of people that get B's, any credit is required for those. I, I agree, it does create that impression and, and I'm concerned about that. So do you think we should take it off there for? I, I would say we should take it off. Okay. So, okay, okay, before before you say anything else, how about as it relates to the, the format for the tests as well as the SONA credits? Um, we put it to a vote, and after that, um, likely the majority, and then my final vote wins. <laughs> yeah. Is there a different option? <laughs> well, again, now, now that I've explained more clearly how the class works, I think it's still, any extra credit still kind of creates this thing. Since we're rank order, it feels like it's required. I don't want it to be that way. Again, if I'm not at BYU, if I'm anywhere else, half the people in the class aren't doing the work anyway. So extra credit's <laughs> awesome, and I can just, you know, bump, bump people up, and it works delightfully. Here, we're, we're competitive and we're restricted, and yeah, the extra credit does create a problem for me. Yeah. Um, well, Luke and I were discussing this, and we came up with the idea of what if you take away one point one percent of the people that do this? <laughs> <laughs> Another thing I wanted to mention is uh, how the points come out in this class. So, historic, you know, the last several years in, in the 401 class, the nature of the content, a lot of it is somewhat qualitative. I think it's, uh, it's hard to come up with tricky exams that are still fair. You guys are amazing, by the way, with how well you did on them. Um, and, and so, 92% uh, so is probably about the class average the last three years in there. I find that with this class, it's a different type of content. It's uh, there really is there are, there are a lot of concepts to know, and historically we've it seems like we're about 80, 88 percent, 87 percent for the average of the class. Now that being said, that's what it was I think the last two years. This year we're doing a little bit different content. We're using a different book. We're putting in the AWS material, so it might shift things. So I think. I think it's still a harder type of material for a lot of people, and so I, I expect the grades to be a little bit lower than in 401 would be. Um, so anyway, so that'll come into play for when the, grade, when the grade adjustments happen. So for all we know, you know, 88% might be an A minus in here uh, historically. Could be. Um, any questions related to all those things? Okay. Just setting expectations. Um, 
Regarding the second exam, uh, you can take the AWS Cloud Practitioner exam, 65 questions, in lieu of the final exam in here. And if you take it and you pass it, let's just say that you pass it with 80%, you get 5% added to that. So you'll get 85% on your final exam. Uh, after discussing it in the last class, the question came up, can we take both? Um, and I said yes. So if you're okay with that, you can take both and you can have the higher of the two. I'm okay with that. Um, the, you'll get a lot of practice. The AWS will provide to us vouchers to take a free practice exam. They'll provide us a voucher for, I can't remember if it's 100% off or 50% off their exam. You will know that you're gonna pass it probably before you pass it. Um, the, only, the only issue is you just need to make sure you schedule it before the class is over. So we're doing it right at the end of class. Um, so, so be careful about that. Don't think like the day before we're going to have you know, 140 people schedule at one of the testing centers in Lehigh and that they're going to have space for that. Um, but if you plan for that, you can take it and I'll give you the higher of either one. Uh, another thought just on that AWS test, I, you guys are super good test takers. I would guess that you guys could, without any studying at this point, probably get 50% on it right now because it has a lot of common sense type things on there, like what's the value of the cloud, what are some security issues. Uh, it's just a, a lot of general understanding about cloud and technology, and 50% of it is going to be about particular technologies that are in there. So if I compare the cloud practitioner exam, exam and the solutions architect Solutions Architect exam, Solutions Architect exam is way harder. Like you're actually debugging and solving problems. Like why is it that um, you're not able to connect, no, so we'll talk about, you know, in this class we talk about ports and things like that. Why is it that you can't talk about or connect to this particular port in the AWS environment? Is it A, B, C, or D? Um, and you have to really know your stuff to differentiate them. So Solutions Architect is pretty hard. Cloud Practitioner, not too hard. I think that, uh, if you watch the videos and material that you have available as part of this class, like I, I think everybody would pass it. You'll take the practice exam that AWS gives you, you might even get 100% on it. So, it's not bad. Uh, would Anybody get 100% on the top? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I know. <laughs> I am going to, I am going to cap the, uh, <laughs> the, what you can get at 100%. So if you get, if you pass their exam at 97%, you just get 100%. So you get 100%, you still get 100%. You don't get 105%. So I hadn't accounted for that question before this morning. But, uh, go ahead. How long does it take you to get the score to the AWS And I'll work with you guys on that. I think they tell you a week, but it, it will come quicker than that, like within about three days. The, right after you test it, it comes up on the screen and says you passed. So you know you passed, but you might not see the score breakdown right away. You say, because like, what if you took the AWS and you're like, oh, I'm not gonna take the final, and then it turns out that you like barely passed the AWS exam, and you're like, well, great, I should have taken the final, because now I'm screwed. Um, <laughs> so there, there are exams, there are exams in this world that are hard, and there are exams in this world that are not that hard. I think on the AWS content, I don't think it's going to hurt you too much to take both of them. And uh, so I would just recommend you take both. So it's not a perfect situation, so I'll just acknowledge that. Not perfect situation, but I'm trying to make the best of it. And I think opening up both of them to you, and, and, and then you choose. I'm not complaining. I was just yeah. curious if there was a contingency to that or something. No, just that, yeah. Can you take the cloud exam multiple times? Wait, wait, say that again? <laughs> um, for my purposes, I'll only allow you to take it once. So you either pass or fail. And so if you do pass it with 80% and wish you had higher, I think they would probably, even if you fail it, I think you have like a minimum two week window that you have to wait. So if you took it in the middle of the semester and took it again, I'm not going to allow that. Um, but I, you know, I appreciate the ingenuity there in the question. Um, so, but what I would say, you know, you could, you could take the class exam if you're trying to bring your grade up. Sure. Okay, I guess I have two questions. Okay. The first is, like, do people in the industry, like, really look for this cloud certification? Or, like, is it, like, is it something that you really need to or should get? It 
it is my opinion that everybody that's coming through an information systems program today should have cloud expertise. And I think to a great degree, if you get certifications as part of this program, people's jaws will drop. And that makes me feel very, very good. So um, a lot of people, as part of their internships and stuff like that, end up getting the certifications. They're like, whoa, I needed this. So let's just formalize it. Um, you know, in the, you know, historically, we needed to know programming, right? This is a little bit newer, but I think this is, this is kind of like common knowledge that everybody should know now. So we're ahead of the curve and saying, let's just get this done. And it's only about three weeks of the class, so yeah, it's, now, now the, the employer you work for someday might decide to go with one of the other cloud platforms. You might go with Azure or, or Google, but it's, if you understand one, you'll be well suited to do the other stuff. I think it's really important. It, um, Amazon's the 800 pound gorilla in this space right now. They're way bigger, have way more offerings, so it's, it's a good place to start. People will be impressed and like you. So. Yeah. This, the, the cloud practitioner is about uh, three years. So all the, so solutions are, they have a whole bunch of them. The entry level one is cloud practitioner. They last three years and then you have to renew. But this, seriously, like this one is like really easy. So you probably wouldn't even have to study three years from now if you were pop working in the space if you wanted to re-up it. What you really want to do is uh, take the solutions architect exam and up your skills if that's an area that you care about. Uh, what I did is, this last semester, I put it into 531. They did both the cloud practitioner exam and the solutions architect exam. They did say in one semester that was too much AWS. So. The, the good news is, though, if I were to argue the other way, so the, for the people that pass the solutions architect exam, average salaries are running like 115, 120. So people complain a little bit. So I'll, I'll take two sides. Okay, I'll step away from professor for a second. I'll just be me. I'm like, dude, why are you whining? Like your your average entry salary here is like is like you know seventy eighty thousand. You can have one hundred and fifty to one hundred and twenty thousand dollars if you just watch like four weeks of boring videos and pass the test. Like, don't complain. Like, just suck it up, okay? And then if you want to take the lower paying job, go ahead. But as a professor, I'm, uh, I'm going to be not uh, something more diplomatic than that. So. <laughs> They complained a little bit, but they shouldn't. It's good stuff. You should do stuff that you don't like sometimes, because you'll be glad later. Um, okay, that's all that. Yes, sir. So I just want to clarify, in your syllabus it says that the final exam is actually comprehensive. Uh, and yeah, that was as of this morning at 7.59. <laughs> so, uh, wherever I have that in there. Uh, yeah, up here. Yeah, the exams. So it was planned to be comprehensive, but I think in order to uh, to make this work again, so there's a little dust on there's gonna be a little dust on this class this semester, and that we're changing the format of things. We didn't have AWS before. We're having this con these conversations, and I don't think there's a clean way for me to have just the AWS content if you pass their exam, and then I have a comprehensive exam. So I'll say it's gonna be almost mostly. Um, AWS content on that final exam if you take it. I might throw in some other stuff, but probably mostly to make it fair and comparable. So, so, so we're, we're making it up on the fly, but as long as you get a certification out of it, people will be super excited. Okay, um, with that, let's talk about computers for a little bit. Okay, without looking at, without looking at Wikipedia, how would you define a computer? Like, what's a computer do? What's it made up of? <coughs> made up of switches. Switches? Plugs? That Switch go from zero to one. Okay. Uh, zero to one is an integral part of a computing device. What else makes up a computing device in your mind? Yeah. Uh, input, output, processing, error. Yes, you answered it perfectly. So how, <laughs> at least where I was going to be going with that. How did you come up with those four items? <laughs> okay, so a lot of so if I were to push this out a little bit, uh, so so last class uh, people started off talking about uh, what you'll probably see on Wikipedia is it's you know it's it's some device that processes information. It it oftentimes has calculations on a lot of ones and zeros. So that's a that's one definition of it. I wanted to take this other definition and run in this direction and say I wanted to talk about it as a computer in terms of being having inputs 
outputs, a, a CPU, so processing logic, and memory. So memory being someplace where we're storing our ones and zeros, could be images, could be some math problem that we're gonna work on a data set. Uh, CPU, something that's going to be doing computations on our ones and zeros. Uh, our inputs and outputs, uh, what would be some examples of outputs? What's an output device for a computer? Yeah? A monitor. Say a monitor, okay. Right on. What else do we have as outputs for a computing device? Fax machine. Okay. I'm going to expand on that and, and, and call that a printer. Okay. So we'll just call it a printer. So we've got a monitor and a printer as output devices for the ones and zeros that are floating around inside your computer. What else are some output devices for a computer? A speaker, yes. So our ones and zeros can be output as sound. Anything else? Yeah. So we could send out electronic documents of certain types. Um, I have a store on my computer. And I send it to you have a what on your computer? I have something stored on my computer and I send it out. Okay. Okay, well. Um, okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, wait. I have to adapt that. So the, 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 the document itself is not an output, but your network card is. Your network card, so that's, that's why I had to stop and formulate in my head. Okay, now I got it. So yeah, the network card itself spitting out a series of electronic pulses um, or radio waves is going to be your output device in that case. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes. So, and that's one one of the ones I wanted to highlight as well. So, not just a monitor or sound, but also robots. So, an output uh, of your, you know, so something to do with your ones and zeros is to physically control a connected device. So, more than just so. So, my point of this discussion is, you know, we, we think of our laptops as typically just having a screen and a keyboard. You know, so a screen is our output device, and, and maybe we might consider sound but we might not think about all these other things. Was there another one? Okay. How about our input devices? What are examples of input devices for our computing devices? Keyboard, keyboard. So our keyboard, yep. Our mouse. Pardon? Mouse. A mouse, keyboard and mouse. Okay, so we got our standard ones. What, are, what about other stuff? Like yeah. Sensors instead of humidity sensors. Okay, a humidity sensor, anything else? Ooh, okay, a fingerprint scanner. I like that. Good. Pardon? A camera. Yes, that would be an input device. Pardon? A microphone. Okay, sound. All right. Uh, let me uh, show you this. I have bought thousands of dollars worth of components for you guys to use with your Raspberry Pis this semester. So as you search for all the projects that are out there, know that I may have purchased a lot of the things that you might, might be interested in. So I'm just going to hold up some things here. Um, this is a voltage level detector. This one is a gas smoke sensor module. This is, so it's a smoke module. This one is a gas detector. This is a carbon monoxide detector. This is a flame detector. This is a temperature sensor. This is a, this is a temperature, yeah, how are we gonna test those? This is a, ten, uh, a temperature and humidity sensor. This is a barometric pressure sensor. This is a, a light sensor. This is a vibration sensor. This is a sound detector. Um, Where's the light detector? The light detector, good question. <laughs> This is a this is a motion sensor. Uh, I also have a water I also have a water sensor in here. Um, the, these are awfully tiny, but this is a uh, I've got about ten of these. These are the cameras. So this is this is literally a camera that you can plug into your Raspberry Pi. So you can use that for a variety of purposes as well. So, so I kind of want to wet your whistle a little bit in terms of what's possible and know that, so, so know that I can loan these things out to you during this semester. 
here's a very common output for for our Raspberry Pi is to power an LED. Yes. Uh, China. <laughs> Actually, I'm really proud of this. So, um, so, uh, so you can buy stuff on Amazon, but you go to AliExpress, so Alibaba. Yeah. So I buy you know, hundreds of of, Ida, of cheap electronics that we can plug into these, and so I was really able to leverage my budget for this class, and I'm super proud of it. Um, uh, so on these pins right here on your Raspberry Pi, programmatically, within just a couple of lines of code, we can say, you know, turn this pin on, turn this pin off, or read from this pin. Uh, so most of those uh, sensors have, you know, four pins on them. So you'll use something like one of these, uh, these jumper cables to connect from one of these pins over to your sensor. With just a couple lines of Python code, you can start reading from it and then do whatever you want. Or you can send output and power some device. Um, so, cool stuff. All right, and then, uh, yes? So I was just wondering, like the smoke detector one, like how would it be designed? Like what does it do? So like it like has like, a, like an air filtration system or something, and it like will like, it, like, it is like a disk gateway or something, like it's like if this like air is gross and stuff, it's like, <laughs> Well, well, I haven't used that particular one yet, but uh, with air, you can pick up like parts per million particles that are floating through, so it just must have some, I don't know if it's like the electricity in the air or conductivity in the air or uh, something which would give it some indication of how much uh, pollution is in the air. And then there must be some further way of measuring that, so. Oh, like what happens? Yeah, well, yeah, that, that was part of my question. Oh. So, so, so any of these sensors, you plug them in, and you put, and you put, you can send the output out to your computer, and, and just like an output statement that's coming in, whether it's C sharp or Python or whatever, just coming in. And usually there's just some scale. So uh, some things are on or off, and some things are a degree. So if you hit a certain level of air pollution or heat or whatever, so usually what you do is you, you can just program it to say what is in, what is the instantaneous temperature right now, uh, or what is the instantaneous air pollution level. But then you, you put logic in there to say, okay, if it hits this, what do you want to do? And so you can, we'll be able to connect to AWS later on and send yourself a text message, send yourself an email. Somebody just walked into my house, tripped my motion sensor, uh, take, snap a picture, write the, you know, a couple <laughs> lines of code and snaps a picture. Like, you can do all this stuff with just a couple lines of code. It's super cool. Um, if you'll bear with me and give me two minutes. planned a whole bunch of extra material that uh, we didn't get to today. Uh, so in two minutes, I'm just going to talk about an overview of what networking is. So when we think about networking, we, we usually think about applications, some type of software that's running. So this might be a web browser over here, and this might be a web server over here. Now, if you are running something locally on your computer, then data communications really don't have much of a role to talk about. But then again, it's not very really useful either. You can't usually make any money by writing something on your local computer that nobody else in the world can see. So we need to have some way for communication to go back and forth between things. At a high, now there's, we're gonna go into a lot of depth, but at a high level, uh, one of the things that makes this possible is we have IP addresses on each side. Some unique identifier, sort of like a phone number. So this one can call out to this IP address like a phone number. It finds it and it responds. But another thing about data communications and network communications is software, not only are we talking to a host or a computer that the app is running on, but we, when we want to talk to an individual application running on there, we also talk to a port. So a port over here might be port 80, and a port over here, I'll just make up some number, 10,031. So, um, what, what, so the combination of IP addresses and ports is what allows computers to talk one to one, one to another. And this also kind of implies that any particular computer can run lots of applications all on different ports with the same IP address. 
So maybe if you call somebody's house, I want to call, I want to talk to Mitchell. Okay, that's on 480. Um, you know, how we differentiate between the apps. Uh, if you know, if I want to talk to David, uh, you know, maybe that's on port 22. So some of the some of the applications that commonly run on certain ports, we have 80 running on web servers. Uh, for SSH, we'll have like 22. Uh, so we'll have a whole bunch of different applications that run on a single IP address with a port associated with it. The combination of an IP address and a port is called socket. We're running over a little bit. I'll just say one, one additional thing. As part of the networking, uh, in order for communication to go between those, those two places, they go through seven layers of technology. Um, we call it the OSI model. So we're gonna talk a lot in this class about how we break things down into different technologies that allow communication. And so what happens is we go from just full-blown words and, and content up here. And then like Star Trek, if you've seen people turn into those little gold dust, and you know, they, so you, you turn into gold dust and then you appear somewhere else. We, we break down communicable information up here into smaller and smaller parts so that when we get down to layer one, that's the physical layer, we communicate things over a wire or by light or by radio transmission. Uh, or sound, anything that can be turned on and off, that's a one and a zero, that's the physical layer, layer one. We send it between two places, and then we take that and we recompose it back up again, back up into something that an application can ingest. So that's a little inter uh, introduction to what uh, the core of the class is about. And I'll be fair with the time, and that's it. So I will send you some messages, we'll do some votes, uh, lab on Thursday, Friday. Yeah. <laughs> Do you need to do anything before you laugh? No, you don't have to do anything for breath. You won't need that for Thursday.